Welcome to KJV Cafe, where we explore great truths from God's holy word in a simple, down-to-earth fashion. Romans 10:17 shows us where faith comes from. So then faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. Let's grow our faith together in the cafe today. Our program is hosted by Pastor Clark Covington and brought to you by Heartland Ministries. Grab your Bible and a hot cup of coffee or tea and join us now as we explore God's holy word. Amen. Glory to God. Welcome to the program. Welcome to the cafe. Hope you are having a wonderful week, a wonderful day. I appreciate you joining me here at KJV Cafe. This is Pastor Clark Covington. So glad to be here as we dive into God's Word, as we look through the Holy Word to see what we can learn to apply to our lives. Because the book is a living Word, amen. And, uh, you know, I was saying last night during our prayer meeting at church, the book, uh, we read it and it reads us, amen. It's a discerner of the thoughts and our heart, amen. And uh, it's the living word. And as we read it, uh, we can be transformed to be more like Christ. And that's our goal here at KJV Cafe is to save souls and edify the saints. And today we are looking that at the uh, verse Luke 137, for with God, nothing shall be impossible. And uh, I kind of am grinning because many people would hear that or uh, repeat that verse or get, you know, get into that verse when they're thinking about, oh, I'm going to win the basketball tournament. I'm going to uh, get an A in this class. I'm going to buy this house. I'm going to take this trip, whatever it is, right? And yet for with God, nothing shall be impossible also applies to his judgment, in a world that's so easy to get discouraged by seeing evil and wickedness triumph, when believers understand God's plan, they understand what's really going on, they realize a judgment is coming. And even though we get discouraged because we see, oh, wickedness seems to be triumphing. I mean, you turn on the media and they're so boastful of the just absolute rebellious behavior uh, it seems like everything in the book that is good has been perverted by the little g God of this world into evil things. The Bible says, woe unto them that call evil good and good evil. And that's what we see here today in so many realms of our society. Amen. We see it in the schoolhouse. We see it in the workplace. We see certainly see it on social media. We're seeing it everywhere. And you may get discouraged and say, where is God's judgment? But Luke 137 tells us with, with God, nothing is impossible, even judging this wicked earth, which would seem like a mighty big task. But when we understand God's judgment, we won't want anyone to face his wrath. Your worst enemy, the one that you despise, and hopefully you've forgiven everyone as the Bible calls us to do. The Bible tells us the Lord can't forgive us if we can't forgive our neighbor. Amen. To paraphrase that. But your worst enemy, you would not want them to face the day of the Lord, the tribulation period, uh, after the church is raptured out, you would not want them to face it. And certainly your worst enemy, you would not want them to go to hell because hell is a real place, amen? And it's not where you'd want them to go. Uh, and I mean that with all my heart and my soul. You, you don't want anyone to go there. God doesn't want anyone to go there. And he desires all to come to repentance, all to be saved, amen? And so we're going to look a little bit about what's going on with God's judgment, how we can make sure we're on the right side of his judgment, amen, and how we can share this truth with others. Our text verse is John 8, 24. I said therefore unto you that ye shall die in your sins, for if ye believe not that I am he, ye shall die in your sins. This is Jesus speaking to the Pharisees and scribes. Let's back up and look at the context. I'm going to give you a text verse. I got to give you context. It's always important to take scripture within the context. And this context is Jesus addressing the Jews, specifically the scribes and the Pharisees. But we can learn a lot about this, about our own uh, walk with the Lord. So G, uh, let's start at John uh, chapter eight, verse one, and we'll just go for a little bit here. Jesus went unto the Mount of Olives and early in the morning, he came again into the temple and all the people came unto him and he sat down and taught them. And the scribes and Pharisees brought unto him a woman taken in adultery. And when they had set her in the midst, they said unto him, Master, this woman was taken in adultery in the very act. 
Now Moses in the law commanded us that such should be stoned. But what sayest thou? This they said, tempting him that they might have to accuse him. But Jesus stooped down and with his finger wrote on the ground as though he heard them not. So when they continued asking him, he lifted up himself and said unto them, He that is without sin among you, let him first cast a stone at her. And again he stooped down and he wrote on the ground. And they which heard it, being convicted by their own conscience, went out one by one, beginning at the eldest, even unto the last. And Jesus was left alone, and the woman standing in the midst. And when Jesus had lifted up himself, and saw none but the woman, he said unto her, Woman, where are those thine accusers? Hath no man condemned thee? She said, No man, Lord. And Jesus said unto her, Neither do I condemn thee. Go, and sin no more. Then spake Jesus again unto them, saying, I am the light of the world. He that followeth me shall not walk in darkness, but shall have the light of life. The Pharisees therefore said unto him, Thou bearest record of thyself, thy record is not true. Jesus answered and said unto them, Though I bear record of myself, yet my record is true. For I know whence I came and whither I go, but ye cannot tell whence I come and whither I go. Ye judge after the flesh, I judge no man. And yet if I judge, my judgment is true. For I am not alone, but I and the Father that sent me. It is also written in your law that the testimony of two men is true. I am one that bear witness of myself, and the Father that sent me beareth witness of me. Then said they unto him, Where is thy father? Jesus answered, You neither know me nor my father. If ye had known me, you should have known my father also. These words spake Jesus in the treasury, as he taught in the temple, and no man laid hands on him, for his hour was not yet come. Then Jesus said again unto them, I go my way, and ye shall seek me, and ye shall die in your sins. Whither I go, ye cannot come. Then said the Jews, Will he kill himself? Because he hath said, Whither I go, ye cannot come. And he said unto them, Ye are from beneath, I am from above. Ye are of this world, I am not of this world. I said therefore unto you, that ye shall die in your sins. For if ye believe not that I am he, ye shall die in your sins. All right, that was John chapter 8, verses 1 through 24. What are we learning here? Well, again, I start off this uh, message with somewhat of an ironic uh, way to look at a verse. Instead of saying nothing shall be impossible with God is a good thing, I said, well, watch out now. Nothing's impossible. He's going to judge the wicked, even though that looks very hard. And now here's another one. In this scripture, many will use this passage of scripture to talking about talk about don't cast judgment on the sinner. Uh, you know, look at what happened with the Pharisees, and then and then Jesus said, uh, "I don't condemn you at all, okay, but go and sin no more, as in stop your sinning." But I'm not going to condemn you, and everyone was convicted of their conscience and so forth. But get this: in this, who does Jesus then start to convict and start to condemn? the Pharisees, the Jews, the people that he was there in his earthly ministry to reach. He tells them, you guys are going to die in your sins. And so kind of, again, it's ironic, it's deep, it's really interesting. It's God's poetic way of helping us understand something. We have two elements. We have the law, okay? And the Pharisees and the scribes were saying this woman broke the law. She should be condemned. And then we have what Jesus is saying is saying, I have fulfilled the law. I've overcome the law. I am greater than the law. I am God. And therefore, great through uh, great by grace alone, through faith alone, and Jesus Christ alone. I always trip over that a little bit. By faith alone, through grace alone, and Jesus Christ alone, we're saved. So you have uh, faith, uh, you have grace through faith, amen, overcoming the law. And you see this dichotomy. You see these two things presented in John 8. It's really fascinating. And we see that we're not justified by works, right? The Pharisees were trying to justify themselves by works. They're saying, look at this woman. She was caught in the very act. We, we've got to stone her. That's the law. And then Jesus turns it around on them and says, well, who, who hasn't sinned here? And then they all are convicted of their conscience, right? They know that they are not able to keep the law. And Jesus presenting to them the truth says, essentially, you have unbelief, because if they had believed on Jesus, they could be saved, and they could be justified by their faith. But they literally said, it is not so, right? John 8, somewhere in here, uh, they said, we don't believe you, you know? 
Uh, uh, here it is. Verse 13, John 8, 13, the Pharisees therefore said unto him, thou bearest record of thyself. Thy record is not true. So the Pharisees and scribes had unbelief in their hearts. They did not believe in Jesus. And therefore it brings us to our, our verse here in John eight twenty four, where Jesus says, I said, therefore unto you that ye shall die in your sins. For if ye believe not that I am he, ye shall die in your sins. And so what we're seeing here is God's judgment will fall upon those that have unbelief, those that have not been justified by their faith. And this is interesting because we get our doctrine as church age believers from Paul, from what they call the Pauline epistles or those letters that Paul wrote to the various churches. Uh, and that's like um, Thessalonians, Corinthians, Romans, Galatians, et cetera, et cetera, right? We, that's where we get our doctrine from. And so we believe Paul's teachings. But what you have to understand is the whole Bible points to this. Uh, Abraham, right? Father Abraham, they, the Pharisees and scribes looked up to Abraham. They, they said, that's their father. Amen. Uh, he was justified by what? Faith. Amen. He believed and it was counted to him as righteousness. And so we understand that this justification by faith alone is woven throughout the whole Bible. And God in his poetic way, in his very uh, beautiful poetic way, helps us understand uh, a very serious principle of his that if we believe on Jesus Christ, not just believe that he existed, not just believe uh, that he uh, is written in, about in the Bible, but believe that he went to the cross for our sin debt that we could not pay. Because remember, Jesus was born of a virgin, lived a perfect, sinless, spotless life. And because of this, when he was crucified on the cross, willingly and obediently, right, he gave himself, gave himself. When, he, when that happened, amen, and he was buried three days to signify his death, and he was risen again, he was resurrected by God the Father, signifying new life. When we believe on the death, burial, and resurrection, as 1 Corinthians 15, 1 through 4 points out, we then are saved. And it's not anything that we did, amen? So we see that there is really this implications to uh, this, this passage of Scripture beyond what's typically preached. That yes, uh, we should be careful not to condemn others for the sin in their life when we don't look inwardly at the sin in our life. And yes, we should not be trying to um, uh, live by the law. But more than that, okay, uh, we and we sh still should try, if we love God, we'll keep his commandments and so forth, we should still try our best to live by the law because that shows action to our faith. But beyond that, we're learning that salvation comes through faith, through, through believing and so the Pharisees and scribes said, not true, Jesus. If they had said, true, Jesus, we believe, they would have been saved, which would have been a radical idea for them because this idea of just being part of the chosen people and following the law is what they had been taught from the time of Moses. And yet this is the truth. And this is what Jesus was expressing to them. And this is what Paul expressed to us. And who was Paul taught by? He was taught by Jesus. Who did he meet on the road to Damascus? Jesus, who went off to the wilderness for three years after that and spent time with Jesus, amen, and learned this radical doctrine and then brought it to the Gentiles. That's anyone that's not a Jew. Now, that's probably the majority of people listening here today. So we see that uh, what overcomes the law? Only Jesus Christ. He fulfilled the law. And we don't have to keep the law to be saved. We are under grace if we believe in Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior. Now, the, the verse here, John 8, 24, Jesus says, you'll die in your sins. Let's look at what it means to die. Now, you have the first death and the second death. Judgment comes for the lost after the first death, before the second. Uh, and what we have here for the saved person is they never fully die because they are born again, right? And so I guess you could say the saved person die, uh, dies to themselves, amen, when they're born again. But once you're born again, you'll live forever with Jesus Christ in heaven, amen? But if you reject J Jesus Christ and his free gift of salvation uh, and what he did on the cross at Calvary, if you reject all that, then you die once, okay, and you're buried, you're, uh, you're, you're resurrected. Everyone is resurrected. Uh, and after you're resurrected, if you were lost, uh, if you were unsaved, if you didn't believe you would go to what's called the white throne judgment. And at that white throne judgment, 
God will be there. Some say God the Father. Um, my understanding, Jesus will be there. But regardless, Jesus and God are the same. Okay, they're they're they are God. So uh, one, if not both, will be there to judge the lost, and that is going to be difficult because every idle thing that that lost person has said will come back and be presented to them. Every rebellious deed that they did, every bad thing that they did that transgressed God's holy ways will be right back brought up to them. And they will not, they will be without excuse. And we could go into a lot of details about why they will be without excuse. Uh, Number one, uh, they'll be without excuse because nature testifies to God. So they could say, oh, God, I, I never had a witness come to me. And then God will bring up the witnesses that he sent to them. Uh, and 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 truly, they'll, I'm sure there'll be many in this information age. Uh, but then also, too, if there wasn't or even addition to that, he'll bring up nature. I mean, he'll say, well, you understood the, how the gravity works and the stars in the solar system and how all the planets are aligned just perfectly so things could work this way. And you understand that how birds migrate and how uh, seeds populate and how air comes from trees and is recycled back into trees and how a cloud can create a river and then it's a cloud again and all of these things. All of nature, the Bible tells us, testifies to God. The Bible tells us we all have some light in us. And so this idea that we would uh, be able to say, oh, God, we never knew, that would be called willful ignorance. That would be saying it's not that we didn't know, it's that we didn't want to know. And why would someone not want to know? I think the atheists say it best. They, I've heard atheists, scientific atheists say, if I knew, if I, if I, if I discovered God is real, then I couldn't live in sin. So what they'll do is they'll be willfully ignorant so they could live a rebellious life. And this will all be brought forth in the great white throne judgment. Now, that's one way it'll happen. But you could actually see God's wrath in the day of the Lord. And that is during the tribulation period. And so those that have accepted Christ as Savior, and I believe this is going to happen very soon, will be raptured out. Here on KJV Cafe, we believe in a pre-tribulation rapture. That is the idea that the church is raptured out before the tribulation period begins. And that belief is based upon all the scriptures showing that there's nowhere the church is going to be involved in the tribulation times. And so we see that the church is raptured out prior to the tribulation, very, very soon in my, in my estimation. And then there's a seven year period. And that seven year period, as you read in the book of revelation is a very, very scary time. And, uh, it starts off with peace treaties and so forth. And the first three and a half years may not be that bad, but those last, last three and a half years are the worst time anyone has ever experienced on earth. Uh, I read a synopsis from a book on, um, Bible.org that was trying to put revelation, Uh, and all of what's said there into like very common language about what was going to happen. And I've read Revelation uh, many times. It shocked me just to read the common words when you kind of translate it in that way. Uh, uh, People will want to die. Hundred pound hailstones will fall from the sky and they can't die. They'll be tortured by these animals that are like demons and they'll, they'll be calling out. They're trying to jump off a cliff and they literally cannot die. And it's going to be that awful. Revelation 15, and I saw another sign in heaven, great and marvelous, seven angels having the seven last plagues, for in them is filled up with the wrath of God. Verse 7 of Revelation 15, and one of the four beasts gave unto the seven angels seven golden vials full of the wrath of God who liveth forever ever and ever. It's not the preacher telling you the wrath of God is coming, it's Revelation telling you the wrath of God is coming. Zephaniah 1, 14 through 15. The great day of the Lord is near. It is near and hasteth greatly. Even the voice of the day of the Lord, the mighty man shall cry there bitterly. That day is a day of wrath, a day of trouble and distress, a day of wasteness and desolation, a day of darkness and gloominess, a day of clouds and thick darkness. You know, this is going to be awful. And it's going, the wrath is going to be, I believe, as as I've understood it, uh, especially awful for Israel, God's chosen people. But God's not done dealing with Israel. In fact, once this church age is over, this age of grace is over, which I believe is about to be over, the church will be raptured out. That's the blessed hope. That's when Christ comes in the sky and calls his church home. The dead in Christ rise first, and then those that are alive and remain will be called up to heaven with him. That's when we get our resurrected body. That's when everything is beautiful. It's going to be glorious. 
and we're going to be in heaven with Christ. Amen. And what's going to happen on the earth? All the believers are gone. You know, all those believers with the Holy Spirit living within us are going to be gone. And so sin and wickedness is going to run rampant in this earth, and it is going to be awful. In fact, if you don't get if you don't believe on Christ now, if you truly don't get saved now, then during the time of the tribulation, the only way to be saved is to be martyred. You have to say, I won't take the mark of the beast, and they cut your head off, and that's how you can be saved. But right now, you can be saved by simply believing, amen? I, I mean, if you kind of compare the two, I'd rather be saved in the age of grace than have to take my chances in the tribulation period with where, as I understand it, uh, the Lord's turning his attention to the Jews and the 144,000 uh, male virgin Jews will be preaching there to the Jewish people. And God is going to save a remnant of the Jewish people in those last days. And so now is the time, today is the day to, to, to accept uh, Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. Do not wait. Do not, do not wait. And guess who is going to be the judge? Jesus Christ. Uh, all believers will be judged. The unbelie- all believers and unbelievers will be judged. Uh, the believers will be judged at the Bema seat, which is like a reward ceremony, like being at the Olympics, but I'm sure much better uh, when they give a medal, right? And so we will be rewarded for anything any believer has done uh, by the working of the Holy Spirit that's not for themselves. It's not wood, hay, and stubble. It doesn't burn up, amen? They'll be rewarded. And then those that are unbelievers will be at the white throne judgment, and they will face uh, the lake of fire after owning up to their works on earth. There's no easy way out for the unbeliever. God will repay those that trouble his saints. Second Thessalonians 1, 6 through 10. Seeing it as a righteous thing with God to recompense, that means repay, tribulation to them that trouble you. And to you who are troubled, rest with us when the Lord Jesus shall be revealed from heaven with his mighty angels in flaming fire, taking vengeance on them that know not God. Okay, so just to understand this, in 2 Thessalonians here, we're talking about a Jesus that is in flaming fire with mighty angels taking vengeance on them that know not God and that obey not the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. Who is Jesus taking vengeance on? Those that didn't obey the gospel. What is the gospel? To believe, amen, to truly believe. And in order to believe, we have to realize that we have a sin debt, amen, that we have a sin debt that we cannot fix on our own. And that is the biggest problem. I tried to tell our little kids, well, we've got a five and six year old, and we're trying to teach them uh, about God's plan of salvation and the way that we're starting with them as they become literate, so to speak, and understanding these concepts, we are talking about the idea of having a sin nature, of what sin is, the understanding that there is that, that all have sinned and, and fallen short of the glory of God, right? Giving them that concept because if they realize they have a need that they cannot resolve on their own, then they can look to the Savior. And it's no different for adults here today. We, we need to look internally. Do we think that we can do something on our own, that our righteousness is good enough? Some denominations teach that, amen? We need to look and realize that our righteousness, our works, will not save us. We are saved by grace alone, through faith alone, in Jesus Christ alone. Revelation 21.8. This is who faces hell. Revelation 21, 8. The fearful and unbelieving and abominable and murderers and whoremongers and sorcerers and idolaters and all liars shall have their part in the lake which burneth with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. So here's the second death. This is where you go after the judgment. And people may say, well, I'm not an abominable person. I'm not a murderer. I'm not a sorcerer, idolater. But notice here in Revelation 21, 8, it says unbelieving. The fearful the un- and unbelieving. You see, if those that do not believe in Christ, can, if they do not believe in Christ, they cannot be saved. Nobody is too good. They don't need to be saved. There is no exemption. There will be some really good, quote unquote, people, right, in hell because they didn't believe in Christ. They didn't think they had the need. They said, I gave to charity. I did this. I did that. I was moral. I was, I was upright. And that Bible just sat and collected dust. They went to the service and just thought about other things the whole time. They thought that, you know, they didn't believe the word was true and on and on and on. That's unbelief. So we need to, I'm not trying to talk anyone out of their salvation, but we need to check ourselves and make sure that we truly believe that we, that we say, okay, Christ is Lord of my life. Let me make him Lord of my life. And look what Jesus wants to do. He is the light of the world. John 8, 12. Then spake Jesus again unto them, saying, I am the light of the world. He that followeth me shall not walk in darkness, but shall have the light of life. Jesus can and will save every lost soul willing to repent and believe on him. 
Psalm 86, 5, For thou, Lord, art good and ready to forgive, and plenteous in mercy unto all them that call upon thee. So we need to realize that God wants us to be saved. That he doesn't, people say, well, how can a loving God send someone to hell? He's not sending anyone to hell. He is giving you the consequences of your decision, amen? If you want to drive real fast with your eyes closed, what's going to happen? You're going to crash that car, amen? If you're going to say, Jesus Christ, I don't want you, well, this is God's program. You're going to not be in, into his heaven because you rejected him. You did not believe on him. And so we need to realize that He's giving us a chance. We Today is the day of salvation. We are in the age of grace. If you are hearing this right now, amen, and the church hasn't been raptured out, then you have time to be saved. And oh, how we can look around at the, at the times of, of right now. Uh, how many times have you heard lately that it's never been like this? I've never seen uh, whatever it is, amen. I've never seen it like this. And you could fill in so many words with that in this world today. Well, how about how about this could be God's very last altar call? saying, just in case you've been wondering when I'm coming, you can clearly see I'm coming soon. And so if you have not been saved, accept Christ as your Savior today. Simply believe on him, what he did at Calvary for you, for the sin debt that you have. Believe on him. I did it, amen. And he will change your life like he changed my life. I believed on him and, and I was out in the world and so forth. And one day I just gave it all to God, amen. And he changed my whole life. He changed my whole life. And it's unexplainable. And here I am today, one beggar telling another beggar, you need to get right, amen? Now, maybe you have been saved, but maybe you're out in the world. Maybe you're raising your kids up out in the world. Maybe you're prioritizing the wrong things. Please, please, please give your life to the Lord. Give, seek the Lord with all your heart, mind, and soul. Ask the Lord to renew the joy of your salvation. Take, take a minute and realize that, that, that tomorrow is not promised. And if we chase material things in this world, what good are they going to do for us in heaven? You know, and you say, well, Brother Clark, I don't know where to start. I'll tell you where to start. You start on your knees in prayer. That's where you start. You turn to an almighty, all-sovereign God, all-knowing, all-powerful, and you say, Lord, forgive me. Lord, help me. Help me get right with you today. Do something with me, Lord. Help me. I want to serve you. I want to be better for you. Lord, help me to get away from these temptations and these snares and these problems. Help me turn to you. And he will do it. Oh, he'll do it. He'll show himself strong. And when he does, give him all the praise and glory. And finally here, when you have a passion for the Lord, and you understand what's happening, and you understand his mighty hand of power and judgment, you will want to tell everyone you know about what is about to go down. And you will need, you will have that burning desire to share the gospel with others. And you have tools like no one's ever had before. You got a cell phone, you got social networks, maybe you got a podcast, maybe you have a newsletter, maybe you've got a, a, a group at work you can share with. Tell everyone you know that the Lord is coming soon and it's time to stop playing church and it's time to stop playing dibble dabbling in the world and it's time to get right with God while we still have a chance because he is so long suffering and he desires us to be saved and to be sanctified, to be living for him until he calls us home. Have courage, have courage to share the gospel with others. Ask God to give you courage. It is time. The day has come to serve the Lord, to turn to the Lord with all your heart, mind, body, and soul. And you will not regret it. You'll praise God for it. I thank you so much for listening. Tune in next time. Take care. God bless. And amen. Thanks for listening to this episode of KJV Cafe. Have a question for Pastor Clark? Email him directly at clark at enduringpromise.org or visit kjvcafe.com and click the envelope button on the homepage. Our program is hosted by Pastor Clark Covington and brought to you by Heartland Ministries. We'll close today with Psalm 119 verses 166 through 168. Lord, I have hoped for thy salvation and done thy commandments. My soul hath kept thy testimonies, and I love them exceedingly. I have kept thy precepts and thy testimonies, for all my ways are before thee.